Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Episode 9, holy smokes. Moving through this really fast. Just going to make sure everything's working okay. <clears throat> Beautiful. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Hope everyone's doing great. Good morning, yes. Thank you for being here early. Uh, I keep saying that I will eventually start recording these, and really, the only, I, I prefer doing them live. Um, Perth, Australia, 815. Ozzy, thanks for being here. Perth, Perth is an amazing, amazing city. You know, it, don't, it, don't they nickname it the, like, most isolated city in the world or something like that? Um, the company I work for. Um, was extending their presence, and I had an opportunity to to work there. And uh, I ended up passing on it just because uh, it'd be too far from all of my family. But I've always been fascinated by Perth. Even as a kid, I thought Australia was amazing. You know, I'm a lover of reptiles. I had all kinds of reptiles as a child, snakes and spiders and turtles and Anyways, what an honor. I'm just, Ireland, wherever you're from, means a lot that anybody would be here. Tennessee, beautiful. I have family all over Tennessee. My mother lived in Memphis for many years. She actually lived on the same street as Elvis, funny enough. And she'd see him driving around in his Cadillac. <clears throat> but yeah, sounds like my audio's good, video's working. Um... What do I want to open up first? Uh, mostly, I just want to kind of thank you guys for being here. Uh, take a little bit of time to recap a bit. Um, you know, kind of go over. Since since I have the, the live function, and I don't use it very often. North Carolina, beautiful. All these great places that I've had the pleasure of being. Um, my grandfather's oldest brother lived in North Carolina, and we'd go um, we'd go see NASCAR races there. Um, North Carolina, South Carolina, the southern states are like a second home to me. Auburn, California, skeptic. It's always good to see you. You're very generous, sweet man. I appreciate. It. I see you in almost in every one of my videos. It means a lot to me. Um, just by a raise of hands, how many people here in chat, Michigan, I've been to Michigan. Um, it was by accident. I was flying to New York in the winter time and we had an emergency land. Um, so I didn't explore much in Michigan, but someday I hope to, uh, Great Lakes area is beautiful. Um, by a raise of hands, who saw the preview video? the um, Hoover Dam video. You know, just give me a yes or a no or raise your hand icon, give you some time to respond to that because I'm going to go over that and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it is really important to this video. So it's kind of a give and take because as I've said before, many of the people that watch my shorter videos or my segments they don't watch the preview videos. So, okay. So most of you. Eddie, I'm going to go over this and review it for you and for future people that watch this episode. It is incredibly important. And I hope you guys that have seen it don't mind hearing some of the highlighted parts again. Um, but yeah, okay. So let's go ahead and get that going. I got a lot of really, really good articles here, so I know you guys hopefully aren't too bored with all the reading I do, but this episode is going to be reading heavy. Um, I really am trying to pack more articles into these videos because you wouldn't believe, you know, I'm nine, this is episode nine, and I probably have only covered half of the material I have. For California, I didn't even I didn't even cover twenty five percent. Old War McMac, thank you for being here. It means a lot to me. I hope you enjoyed my talk with Longo last night. Those of you who were there, 
I'm running on very little sleep. I was up till about 10 o'clock talking to Longo. And then I woke up early to prep for this. So I'm going to be a little sluggish. I'm sure there'll be a lot, few reading errors, and but give me a little grace on that. Um, if you haven't had the chance, I did a two-hour episode with Longo, Dr. Longo, Old World Florida last night. And I was super happy with it. We we kind of just wanted to go into it with no layout and just see, you know, how it went um, shooting from the hip. And I think it went fantastic. So check that out. It's on my lives page. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. We covered a lot of really interesting subjects. We touched on radium again, which is a you know favorite subject for a lot of people. We touched on, um, you know, he shared some material that he had on giant reptiles, dragons in Florida. And you guys know, uh, eventually I'll be doing a um, episode just on petrifactions and and giant animals of the past, because um, I have you know an incredible amount of material just on that. So yeah, check, make sure to check that out. Um, I'm going to cover the um, Hoover Dam article right now, but I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a full page article. It's a lot. And so if you want more, more information on that, make sure to go check out the episode nine preview video. It's, it's labeled, um, Hoover Dam buried in ancient metropolis. And you, for those of you that have stuck around, I just finished watching the episode. Of, awesome. Awesome. Ozzy. Did you like it? what do you think? Um, for those who don't know the, I've been postulating quite often that many of the the, the large damming projects that went on in the late 1800s, early 1900s were, in fact, burying quite a substantial amount of ancient culture downstream. And whether or not this is purposeful or not, you know, I try not to get too dark. I don't always think that it's just nefarious. Um, these people relied on water as we do today. So I'm sure there were instances um where these damming projects were a necessity and they were building on the most, um, from an engineering standpoint, the most productive place on the river. Um, I've also postulated that many of these dams existed long before and perhaps are far older than the 1800s and maybe even existed. Um, you've heard me talk about star forts and, you know, the star forts go back to the early 1700s in America. Right. You know, we, we, we don't, wagons don't even exist on the West coast. Stellium, thank you for being here. It means a lot. So, you know, how they're building some of these star forts, you know, the Hudson river alone, have like 20 star forts. Um, check out my Twitter for this powder horn that they discovered and that went through auction and it's, um, shows all the star forts of New York on the powder horn. And it's incredibly incredibly immense it's far beyond what anyone would think was actually really existing here in america um but yeah so let's go ahead and jump into the um the hoover dam article so we can do a quick review of that um and then we can get started here because there is a lot of material today so let's go let's present for those of you that have gotten in since i've started welcome Thank you for being here. It means a lot to me. A lot of people from all over the world. So that's fantastic because that helps because there's not going to be a lot of people on the West Coast that are getting up this early, you know, for, for, for little old me. So it means a lot. Let's see if I can go this way with it. And that does makes no difference. So we're going to zoom in. Okay. Let's just read the title here really quick because there are people that haven't seen this yet. This is from 1936. It's a California newspaper. Um, it's called The Ruins of Lost City to be Buried by Boulder Dam. Now, Boulder Dam is Hoover Dam. It was originally called Boulder Dam. You can see clearly the picture here. I'm just going to highlight the images as I did in the video and touch on a few important parts, and then we're going to move past this. Lost City. The crumbled ruins of a metropolis that flourished on the other side of the world when the empire of Rome was declining 
is slowly being hidden for all time in a second burial, which there could be no resurrection. Drifted sands of Nevada's arid southern regions held the secrets of a race of Americans never seen by white men. Now we're going to destroy that narrative as we've been doing all the way into Oregon, into, into Alaska. We have Greeks, we have Chinese, we have Phoenicians in Alaska, in Oregon, Washington, California, Arizona, Tijan red-haired races, Chinese people. Remember, I told you that many of these, quote, phenotypes were living to get together. Several of these cities had pygmies, had four-foot to five-foot tall um darker skinned straight haired what we would call a mongolian phenotype others had what we call a chinese which is very similar just a bit of a different type of language the pottery is a big clue um we have chinese symbols in alaska we have phoenician writing and ships found in oregon we have similar things in california you'll remember the colorado episode where 60 feet below ground, they found an intact Phoenician Moorish boat. Now, it's incredibly important that even in the 1800s, that these people are saying that a Phoenician boat is a Moorish boat. And in later articles, when we get to the Northeast, you're going to find they use the same classification for Viking. And in the Washington episode, we talked about um, a Viking Norwegian explorer found um, they found his traces of his camps all over Washington and north and southern Canada, and this was in 1100, the 1100s. So the date that we have a lot of problems with the dates. <clears throat> Congrats on the hire! Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, send send positive vibes. Um, there's a good chance for a part two with Greg at the higher side so that would be fantastic so stay tuned for for that so yeah as we've been saying all of the phenotypes or many of them existed here as they did in the yucatan the stories of atlantis describe the same thing you had mongolians again these these classifications didn't exist if you look at it from a root race standpoint which i discussed a little bit last night with dr longo this makes more sense and the languages and the phonetics are a big clue to this all, you know, this kind of coming from this, this elaborates on the Tower of Babel, the um, dispulsion of the peoples. Um, I think this is also related to the frost or ice age event that shut out a huge portion of the world and shoved everyone into the equatorial range. <clears throat> Anyways, back to the article. Uh, okay, so the remnants of a forgotten, uncovered race were discovered and barred in their desert grave in 1924. And now at the will, seemingly, of the water gods worshipped by the ancient people, the dead city will be buried again, this time beneath the dammed up waters of the Colorado River. Lost City lies in that doomed valley behind massive Boulder Dam. Gradually, the waters of the Colorado, flowing steadily out of the Grand Canyon into a Moapa Valley, are rising up the hillsides that are now from the shores of Lake Mead. So they're talking about all of the land beyond, behind. So you can see this image of the dam here. The waters behind are slowly rising. It took, I think, it, I believe it took two or three seasons of snow and, and melt and snow and melt to raise the lake level. So they had, a, I believe it was two or three seasons to do these excavations. Where was I? Flowing steadily, Moapa Lake. The valley floor has become a lake bottom, and the partially excavated Indian metropolis soon will be submerged as long as the dam remains standing. Now, an important um, thing to remember for those of you that have been watching along through many of these episodes, we've kind of been blowing a hole in this whole thing, right? If we're dealing with a lost city sitting on the surface, what are we dealing with below ground? Because every one of these um, large cities that's on surface level is connected to a immense subterranean building or realm or mini buildings. And so it just makes you think. And then uh, here it says, 
whence did the inhabitants of the lost city come and where and when did they go the answer is lost in the midst of the past only skeletons of the dead and the crumbling walls of the dwellings remain at the brow of this hill the rising waters of man-made lake mead will stop this resurrected group of houses so they they rebuilt um out of adobe a, a similar structure but um we're dealing with a culture very much related to um the past episodes right because the more advanced culture and systems of irrigation and construction they lie below ground several layers in fact now we've shown also <clears throat> because they talk about mounds they talk about several mounds and they talk about that this city was buried once before and they dug it out well that's just like what we were uncovering in colorado and in arizona basically all of them they have we found mounds from alaska to here if you remember in the alaska video the prospector noticed a mountainside had washed away a cliff face had washed off of a mountain from um either a landslide or a, a you know an earthquake he wasn't sure and inside of this mountain was a grecian city okay washed away covered with mud we're finding similar things here now, one of my favorites was in Colorado, there was a mound that was four miles in circumference. There was one giant building that had been covered by, you know, a thousand years of sand and, and earth and debris and had trees growing on it. And these mounds are found all over the southern states. This is something a lot of that doesn't get touched on very much, right? You have the mound builders of the Mississippi Valley and in that region, but the biggest mounds are here in the southwest it's incredible they're he, they're monumental in arizona we had the giant buildings that went four or five stories below ground that were covered it goes on and on they're finding giants remember six to seven feet tall now that may not be what you know what grabs your attention is giants but you have to remember that most of the people buried alongside these six seven foot tall men were four feet tall and that these were the warriors these were the, the this is the foundations of the tesian or the red-headed men they believe the oldest skeleton um then one of the oldest mummies on earth was that one we talked about in new mexico emperor tigrinus right he was six six and they believe him to be much larger because through the mummification and the, the drying out process you 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 shrink considerably all your vertebrae just stack on top of each other all that cartilage disappears and we're going to get into some good redheaded stuff here in this episode too and here i am rambling when i keep saying the key to getting through all this is to to be efficient and uh, cover as much ground as i can but i'm rambling again but these are important things to talk about so and i know a lot of you haven't seen this um so yeah we'll just do a little bit more here and we're going to move on for the sake of time um for those of you that are interested i have a whole video on this article it's full of amazing detail and they cover a lot of uh things they uncovered pottery um irrigation stuff like that that's in the preview video for episode nine you can find that in my videos tab um, i'll put that in the description after this video is done so yeah um boulder dam Barry's ancient metropolis they go on to say that there are other that this whole area was a metropolis it wasn't just one city right they didn't describe any other parts but as we've been uncovering where there's one large structure like this there's bound to be hundreds hundreds of gigantic ones and that's what we're going to get into um which one was this let's see I have some interesting ones. They're going to obviously kind of set the tone for the size of the ruins. And the one that's in Nevada. Okay, here we go. Let's do this one. Um, you know, mining is a really important part of all this. Here's where we're going to start. It's right here. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more for you guys. Yeah, there we go. Um, you know, mining play, plays a cru crucial role. We've talked about this again from Alaska all the way to here. And there's a reason for this um all of these mines were ancient they were being worked all the way back into you know the this emperor to time you know they were mining mica and emeralds and 
turquoise and jade and all kinds of materials. You know, mining is as old as, as mankind. And many of the mines that we're talking about now are have been worked in ancient times. And Nevada was absolutely one of the most mineral rich places here. You know, California, Nevada, I'd say. Um, Nevada competing with California, believe it or not. And we're going to get into petrified wood and the importance of that in what it is it that, it, you know, what the mining industry really is. You know, what are we mining? Organic life is my opinion. Tr large trees, large creatures. You know, through these episodes, we've shown giant men that were turned to crystal and silver in California. We've shown giant lizards that were petrified and turned into crystals, giant coconuts, giant trees. Um, giant, just about every type of organic matter from, from plant life to reptiles to mammals. In just about every one of these episodes we've shown, they find large versions of these creatures, large, I mean, the quote megafauna is far closer to our time frame. In fact, we're showing that men were living alongside these giant creatures and fighting them in many cases. And that these giant, you know, these trees and plants were huge and these animals were huge and the men were, you know, huge. And uh, in the Emperor Tigrinus example, he was made king and he was buried with all honors. And, you know, he was living alongside these other, quote, phenotypes. We're not just dealing with races opposed to each other or, you know, the Chinese just coming from the other side of the world. Remember, we had Malay in Mexico. We had Malay in the Yucatan. We had um, quote, Indian, you know, this was India superior. Sanskrit's found all over America. Chinese is found all over America. Hebrews found all over America. You know, this is the foundations of a lot of this, you guys. And I journey to say the story of Babel, um, originates here for sure. So yeah, let's get into this article. This article is, doesn't have the title, the date. I'll get to it later. I believe it's the late 1800s. So, yeah, this one's called The Wonders of the Nevada Underground Villages and Highways. Okay, this one's incredible. Uh, hey, good to see you guys. Thank you again for our people that have joined since I've started. Appreciate you joining me at such an early hour. It means a lot to me. 101, 101 people, beautiful number. Um, yeah, so we're getting into the articles and we're going to get kind of efficient here. And I'll try not to ramble too much, which is tough, tough for me. The Wonders of Nevada Underground Villages and Highway, the Virginia, Nevada Territory Enterprise, contains a very interesting description of the existive works of the silver mines in and around that place. Now, remember we talked about the relation of old systems, old cave systems, old underground systems, and the military um, distributions of the deep underground bases and how I believe they're repurposed old, um, not only mines, but habitations and this one is a very good example of it there are whole communities and villages underground with cars steam engines and many of the other appliances of upper world life it says descending at the collar works by a perpendicular shaft over 400 feet in depth one may wander off in almost every direction by two or three different roads we might travel eastward nearly half a mile and finally coming out to the light of day in the southeastern suburbs of the city among the mills and miners' cabins. Okay, so come out to the light of day, right? But as you'll see, we, we, we stay underground for the majority of this. But we will take another course, leaving the village of the Collarites. We travel northward. Along the sides of the narrow streets are glimmering lights. Now we're back underground. Some twinkling far ahead like distant stars and others flashing suddenly upon as we turn the corners of the blinding um, affluence of light. As we proceed on our journey, we meet with many picturesque groups of miners at their labors. Here they are delving out of chambers in the precious silver rock, and there hoisting into place the stout timbers that are to support the mountain and the city above. We pass through roomy caverns whose space robs our candles of light and huge caverns where the light of the candle doesn't even touch the walls in whose walls yawn gloomy galleries leading we know not whither 
and about within whose black portals cubic pyrites and brilliant quartz crystals flash back the light of our candles in a thousand glowworm twinkles. After passing through the subterranean villages of the divers' mining companies, we come to the thriving settlement of savage people. Okay, we're all underground for this whole story. So when they're coming to cities, they're coming to subterranean cities. And there are several. And they're run by different companies or savage people. Having halted in their hospitable hamlet long enough to hear the latest underground news and to make some inquiries relative to our road to the next village, the home of Gould and Curry tribe, we take our leave and, and pursue our journey. Of course, we see many wonders met with numerous adventures and encounter more than one solitary traveler, but not a solitary horseman. Walk on the brink of more than one yawning chasm and experience numerous and mixed sensations, but finally reach the Golden Curry clan in safety. We find them quite a civilized people. This the, the language here is incredibly interesting, okay? It's like Lord of the Rings. You know, you got all these different groups, um, these different, quote, peoples living in these underground cities, right? Although more than 400 feet below the streets of the city, we find here a large building with a huge steam engine in it, puffing away as comfortably as though there was no surface to the earth. With green trees, singing birds, and sun shining everywhere. Very interesting. We enter the building and take a seat, sip a glass of champagne, light a cigar, and we watch its alluring smoke mingle with the white wreaths of steam from the hissing engine. Wonder whether we are really within the earth or upon it. Lamps are burning upon the walls. Persons are passing through the room in which we are seated. Are going downstairs, coming upstairs, bustling in every direction. A new face each minute. We seemed to have stumbled upon the gnomes. We find in passing through the village that the people here have railroads in every direction, and as in the world above, have to clear the track, for the rushing trains with fiery eyes dart wrathfully out of the dark and lonesome roads. With a whiz, the cars fly, plat, fly past us and sweep away down long, along what seems one of the dreary lanes to Satan's dreary kingdom, a byway leading straight to the smoky capital. About us, we occasionally hear the splashing of water mingled with creaking sounds and pass through places where the air strikes damp and cold upon our cheeks to enter where it is hot and stifling. So they're going to all these different cities, railroads going in all directions, um, cities lighted up like the sun. Some places are cold and damp. Other places are warm and stifling. Suddenly, peals of thunder burst out our heads and every gallery and cavern echo echoes its roar. Our nerves are soon quiet, for we know that the noise was but the discharge of a ton of ore through the chutes above. There are inhabitants far above us toward the surface of the earth. The place is like a huge anthill. Again, upon a sudden, upon our, su okay, this is spelling, ears are rent by an explosion ab above, below, somewhere, which causes us for a moment to suppose that the earth has burst in its center and is no longer a thing of sustainability. We know that it was but a blast which thus caused the whole place to shudder and smile at our late nervousness. There are many roads leading from the Gould and Curry, and we might travel half a mile in several directions, but we will continue our journey northward and rise to the surface at the works of Best and Petra through a shaft some 400 feet in depth. Here we land nearly 10 miles north of where we descended. So like I was saying, they didn't even go to all these cities, and they ended up 10 miles away from where they started. So they traveled through all these different groups and cities and tunnels and everything, and they, they traveled at least 10 miles, and they said they still could go in all directions. So they, don't, they didn't even explore this place. They traveled in one set direction, and every time they were amazed by what they found. 
and they ended up 10 miles away from where they descended. Our underground highways are being extended daily in every direction and will soon be connected with Gold Hills mines, and these again of those of American Flat. In, in very few years, more there will be miles on miles of these subterranean streets meandering under and running from one to another of our cities. So even before he mentioned the gnomes, this strikes very much like a Lord of the Rings article to me. Um, you know, the, all the different cities, he describes a savage people, he describes a civilized people. You know, he's not just, just saying as it would be, you know, in, in modern language. This is very interesting, very interesting language. And we're dealing with um, different companies, but he doesn't necessarily describe them as companies. He describes them as, as groups of people. So it's like you have all these different races living underground. Just reminds me of the dwarfs and the gnomes. And so, yeah, I just love that. Okay. We're, you know, hundreds of miles. And in many cases, it, you know, that's kind of correlates with uh, what I've been talking about, especially from California where, you know, they were finding um, endless miles of, of caves and tunnels under hundreds of feet of lava flow. Um, but yeah. So I hope you like that one. I just think the language in this one's so fascinating. Yeah, we're going to keep moving along here. Um, let's jump in. Do we want to do petrifactions or do we? Yeah, we'll do that one first. Um, we're going to get into the history of Las Vegas. Uh, why I think Sin City and the gambling capital of America is what it is today. And I don't think it's an accident. And, you know, Vegas sits on the ruins of some ancient serpent worship and some interesting groups of people that were um, already aware of gambling and dice and so forth. So I think it's very fitting. So we'll get into that one next. But for now, we're going to hop into this one. Wonderful petrified forest discovered in Nevada. And why is this one pertinent, I think? Well... Much of what we just discussed in the previous article about these um, mining tunnels, I think that that mining shaft that they're in, the ant hill, right? Just picture that because a lot of the underground dumps look like ant hills. They really do. And if you picture these shafts going 400 feet down and you have the city resting on top of the surface, right? I think of that whole structure being inside of a giant tree stump. Or not even a tree stump, but a tree that goes far below ground, right? And that all these shafts, they're they are chasing the ore. Just like the veins of a human body, the veins of a tree run kind of perpendicular vertical shafts. And then they sprawl out with the root systems and go horizontal. And you'll find that. You'll find a shaft, they hit the ore. And then they follow the ore. Sometimes it goes off in, in slight degrees up or down. And then they, they, they get all the ore they can. And then they go farther down. And that's what these people are doing. So that whole article we just read, I think, that whole beehive system with, with tens of miles in all direction of bustling railroads and cities and is inside one massive tree. And then this on the surface level, remember, as we keep going up on surface level, things get smaller. When you go far enough down, the animals are gigantic. The, the seeds of trees are gigantic. The trees are massive, you know, a thousand feet in some cases. Um, and as we get to the surface level, the people get smaller. The animals get smaller. The vegetation gets smaller. The trees are a perfect example. They get smaller as well. So, yeah, San Francisco newspaper from 1896. This is called Wonderful Petrif Petrified Forest Discovered in Nevada. 30 feet of a petrified tree had a total length of over 200 feet. This fallen giant had a diameter in some places of nearly six feet and had the aspect in every way of a petrified piece of timber with the bark knocked off. The above picture was taken at a point where the tree had fallen across a ravine. So that's this image right here. I'm just going to read the captions and then we'll get into the article. So over here we have the petrified remains of two forest giants. Let's do a little zoom in for you guys. Yeah, 
These stumps are nearly 10 feet above the ground and the roots reach downward about 20 feet. So this gentleman right here is standing next to two trees. Okay. And what's important to remember, as we've discussed many times, is when these trees petrify, they turn into opals and quartz and silver and copper. In our last episode, I believe it was our last episode, New Mexico, we talked about the, the forest that was 60% copper. These trees were petrified and were 60% copper. They rang like a bell. They had one of the largest percentage per ton of silver. So all these mining operations, they're mining organic matter, and I believe they're mining trees. Coal, sandstone, sandstone is, is, is trees, it's petrified layers of trees. Um, it can be other things. Even as we get into this article, we'll find that even people, humans, when they petrify, depending on the conditions, they can turn into yellow sandstone, all kinds of things, silver ore, crystals. But yeah, so let's keep reading some of these here. End of tilted stump. The sand and gravel have been washed away from around this petrifaction, exposing about six feet of it. The indications are that this is but a small part of the tree still intact. It goes underground. Stump six feet high surrounded by petrified chips. You'll find that the petrified chips are just flakes of the tree. You know, they break off into these chunks. You know, anyone that's seen a, a tree stump that's been broken or fallen over, there's all these jagged pieces. Thank you, COS, Cuss. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your kind words. All right, we're going to jump into this. Deep in the wilds of Humboldt County, Nevada is the most wonderful petrified forest in the world. Although the place has been known to cattlemen and hunters for many years, news from its excitement, from its existence, sorry, has just reached civilization. In a way, it was discovered last fall by a party of exploring campers, one of whom was Miss Ida Meacham, Strongbridge, the well-known writer. This lady, while on the trip, secured a number of good photographs of the strange petrifactions a set of which she has just presented to the Academy of Sciences, where they have caused the greatest interest among the members. The photographs leave no doubt of the remarkable character of the locality referred to, and no doubt much more of interest will come to light as the years go by. The most remarkable aspect of this wonderful petrified forest is the fact that many of the trunks are still standing. Some of these are at least 15 feet above the ground, and where the trees grew on cliffs, the roots can be traced downward for at least 30 feet. Exactly like I was talking about. Just a pic picture that like I was showing you. Like, you know, when you see a tree and its roots start to extend horizontally, if you look at a mining, you know, you can find cutaways of ancient mines from the 1800s and 1900s, even modern mines today, that the shafts are just, they're just going down the shaft of the tree. And then the shafts run horizontally as they chase those veins because the sap of a tree, when it petrifies, they found every tree's sap is composed of slightly different chemicals. And those chemicals crystallize when they're petrified into all these different minerals. So oak trees and pine trees, all these trees, their, their sap, which is their blood, because the sap even contains iron, which is incredible because sap is magnetic. And sap, like human blood, creates cavitation, kind of a suction, and it pulls water all throughout the system. And on my episode last night with Dr. Longo, I talked about um, radium springs being remnants of these fissures within trees. Hangman lays it down about this subject. Absolutely. I've mentioned Hangman before, and I talked about him in my Colorado episode. Um, yeah, if you want to chase this material further, I strongly recommend Hangman. Was it 118 or something like that? Don't know the number, but you can just type in Hangman 11, he'll pop up. So, yeah, shout out to him. Shout out to Stellium 7. We've been bouncing these petrified ideas off of one another for three, four years now. Okay, where was I? The exact location of this wonderful region 
is northwestward from the station of Humboldt. It's nearest railroad communication, 100 miles straight as the crow flies. To reach it by the shortest route, you must cross more than one range of mountains and a 30-mile wide desert. That, for the greater part of the year, is waterless. Then one goes journeying through Skyland, up among high mesas, that meeting the sky mark a level horizon. A vast area of tablelands innumerable there, flattened tops bound round with a wall of rim rock. The petrified trees are, are in the heart of the Virgin Valley, and to reach the valley, one is compelled to go down Hell Creek Hill. Perhaps that is why the forest is so little known, and that the fact that the road there is simply a cow trail. Over but once a year, the cook wagon of the fall Rito is driven when making its rounds as the bakers are gathering beef for the great California cattle king whose stock range it is. Okay. With the brake set and a rock off, goodly size under each wheel, in defiance of the law of gravity, a four-horse wagon one day obligingly clung to the perpendicular side of Hell Creek Hill, that the camera might bear witness to the outside world that such things could be. This road is one of the penalties of the trip, another, which is not a penalty but a pleasure to some, and ought to be such to everyone, is the camping out, alone, afar from human voice or habitation. It is, at times, that necessitates. Yeah, you imagine, you know, you really had to want to go to see this, you know, as they're stating. It's quite a few days' journey and, you know, going 100 miles by horse in incredibly rugged wilderness is no easy feat. And to carry, you know, you, you know how large a camera was in 1890. So very interesting. Yet it is a good thing. Lying down at night in the open where the air is so sweet, cool and dry, the sweeping out fills one's lungs with new life and one's veins with a new keen delight. What better bed would you than to have a hole of earth beneath you and all of heaven overhead? A canopy made of infinite night sprinkled with a diamond dust of stars. But whether you care for a camp bed made out under the sky or not, it will very likely fall to your lot if you find your way into Virgin Valley. For hospitable though the inhabitants of that part of Humboldt County be, the ranches are scattered and far apart. Once in the valley, a generous welcome is extended to the traveler at the little cabin where Tom Sizer, a ruddy-faced Englishman, is host. Tom Sizer, who knows the petrified forest as no one else does, and who is the kindest of his kind as guide. There could be no housing in the in the world fuller of hospitable cheer than the one we'll find in this rough little cabin where the walls are prepared with English and American illustrated weeklies, and the unpainted shelves fill the wa waver and hide while you sit with your upward turned palms. Sorry, worn books and the accumulated litter of a bachelor's camp. When the day is done and you have enjoyed a supper of, of broiled trout, you will swear was never tasted before. Tired from a day's hard journey, you may sit there and gathering in dusk, your big homemade chair drawn up before a great sagebrush fire that goes roaring up the chimney from the broad flagged earth, a fire that snaps and sparkles and cracks as it replenished from the heap of sagebrush piled more than halfway to the ceiling. For the sake of time, we're just going to skip ahead. It really doesn't talk too much about it until we get to about here. The gullies and washes leading down to the meadow are frequently graveled, and the fine flakes of wood that brittle as glass crackle and crumble under one ho horse's footfalls. One of the stumps are within a district of a mile square, and there is one particular portion containing about 150 acres that is rich in specimens of knots and gnarls, and the twigs and limbs that lie scattered about, whatever you may turn, a soft earth bank of perhaps five acres shows the end of the log stumps and the roots of the trees protruding everywhere. A stump eight feet high and of the same diameter stands alone in the midst of endless chips from the workshop of the great carpenter of the world. Yeah, I love that line. From the workshop of the great carpenter of the world. 
you just imagine, you know, this place got hit by, you know, some incredible event that turned all these trees and we're dealing with fairly small trees that are on the surface level. So events like this have happened more than once. And just imagine all the wood is, is like glass underneath the horse's feet. Across a little goalie made by heavy winter rains, a log lies a f like a footbridge with over 30 feet of its larger end protruding from the hillside, which hides the other end. How far it may reach underground, how tall it may be when it fell, we cannot see. The 30 feet and more that are exposed show the entire length but a six-inch taper. Barely there were giants in those days, as compared with the little aspens of today, we, the stone pines, live monarchs of the mountains about Virgin Valley. So, yeah, I mean, they're describing that this this type of, of tree is the largest that they found. And they're tiny, really, in comparison um, to some of the, the trees that we've been covering on this show. But I just wanted to touch on that because just like Arizona, just like Oregon, just like Nevada, I'm sorry, New Mexico, and Colorado, you have an incredibly large area of land that these organic life forms, reptile, um, tree, you name it, shells, coconuts. Remember the petrified fruit in Colorado? There were coconuts, giant coconuts growing wild in Colorado. Giant... Um, apricots as we'll get to here when we talk about nevada being the possible garden of eden giant apricots the largest ever found were found in nevada petrified apricots uh, petrified figs the largest ever found found in nevada that's uh, pretty incredible we talked about the corn we talked about the wheat the most ancient wheat ever found was found here in america the most ancient corn ever found was found here in America, and it was found buried with mummies. Mummy, mummy wheat and mummy corn were both taken and planted and grew unlike any corn and any wheat that they've ever seen. It was drought resistant. It was two, three, four times the yield and often twice the size. Um, you remember my mummy corn. The corn was 13 feet tall, and the ears of the corn were as long as a man's forearm. You know, that's, you know, I got to, obviously I'm, I'm kind of tall, but you know, that's two and a half, three feet in some places. So yeah, thanks for uh, sticking with me so far through these articles. Um, let's hop into, we'll come back to the Las Vegas stuff because that's going to correlate with some other stuff down the road. So we're going to jump over to, um, we're going to jump into my um, thread that I made on Twitter. And again, for anybody who's new to this, I make a thread for every show. So you can follow along with what I'm presenting and you can go back yourself and, you know, take your time, reread articles. And yeah, so I've done one of these for every single show. And, um, and then I have stuff that I don't make a, a post for on Twitter or old posts that I haven't used. And uh, it makes it easier for everybody. So if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you are. You don't need an account to look this up. I will have this post in the description when the video is over if you want to go back and look through it. So, yeah. Uh, where did I want to go? Now I've kind of lost my train of thought. What was it? Okay, let's do the petrifaction really quick. Okay, so we were talking about sandstone, right? And that magical sandstone layer that exists in many places. And when you find some of these um, gigantic adobe places or these mesas where the cliff dwellers had dug miles, endless miles of tunnels, and you had huge subterranean cities inside these mesas. So remember these mesas, well, not all of them, but many of them, um, you know, the Southwest Grand Canyon, these regions, there are tunnels going through all of them and they housed millions of people, you know, in Colorado, they were writing that they must've been at least 10 million people 
dwelling inside the cliff mesas. So just imagine, we talked about the irrigation and the canal works of Arizona and how that was so large and vast, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of miles of canals must have fed thousands or millions of people. Okay, so they are, are extending a city and they're digging up an old graveyard to continue the city. All the bodies, uh, 14 bodies were exhumed last week. So this is Petrified, Re Petrified Remains, Montana, 1877 or 1887. I apologize. Petrified Remains, 14 bodies were exhumed last week at the Hopkins Graveyard in the northwest part of the city by G.W. McLean and James Boyce and re-entered in deep wood. All the bodies had moldered away and not by dust and bones were left to mark the places where the dead had been laid to final rest, except that of Mr. Burton's sister, Kate, whose remains had become petrified from the waist to the knees. The petrifaction was perfect, and the limbs were shown lifelike in shape and form. The upper and greater part of the petrifaction was white while the lower part had become colored, resembling in color our yellow sandstone. It was solid stone while the remainder of the body had crumbled away. These remains had been buried about 20 years. The grave in which they had been interred was deeper than the others, being about six feet below the earth's surface. There was no water in the grave at the time of exhuming the body, but Mr. McLean says there was unmistakable evidence that water had been there. Um, there was another article that I wanted to present that I just couldn't find. But um, off the top of my head, a gentleman in Nevada of some financial stature had decided to make his entire casket. It was out of wood, but it was lined with zinc. And... They exhumed the body, I believe it was 30 years post-burial, and he had been completely petrified, completely turned to stone. Um, and the zinc had, you know, preserved the body. It was quite an interesting article. I, that's all I can really remember from it. But I wanted to touch on this one because when we're talking about different types of organic matter petrifying, the substances that come from it are completely determined by the um, atmosphere and the um, the the way that the body was entombed. You know, it doesn't always have to be some electrical discharge that causes the petrifaction. Um, petrifaction can occur slowly over time, and it does create so petrifactions that happen instantly. Again, the environment will dictate what comes of that petrifaction, the, the level of voltage, the temperature, all of these things. This is proven. You can find articles about it today. There are linemen all over the world right now that have had some kind of an electrical um, accident on the job and their hand turns to stone, their feet turn to stone whatever part of the body is, is reacted to the, gr the grounding of this electrical current. <clears throat> this happens frequently, believe it or not, when you're dealing with, you know, such high voltages and you have all these, you know, millions of people d doing this worldwide, the accidents, when they happen, the results can be quite astounding. And they've shown men, linemen that have had their entire foot turned to stone inside their boot, um, hands, arms, legs, it's pretty amazing. So from here, let's do, we're going to do the Carson City article, which is one of my favorites. It's kind of a long one, but it's absolutely worth it. Yeah, here we go. So yeah, the petrifaction stuff. And as we go farther through these articles, we're going to cover more large cities and we're down to, you know, 50 minutes. So I'm going to kind of kick my butt into gear. I also want to uh, say again, thank you for everybody that has joined me for this episode. Um, yeah, it means a lot. 150 people here. Awesome. See if we can break 200 again. That'd be fantastic. Um, so yeah, let's jump right into it. The Carson Footprints, California, 1893. 
prisoners unearth a prehistoric promenade, three acres of prehistoric footprints, birds and men of gigantic size, elephants, horses, tigers, deers, wolves, and dogs. Elephant stuck in the mud. Footsteps of a man 18 inches moves quickly towards it. The Carson Footprints. A gang of convicts quarrying sandstone. Sandstone. Think about it, guys. You know, how does this keep coming up? It's it's amazing. You know, when you when you're when you're talking about marble quarries, sandstone quarries, granite. These are just segments of incredibly gigantic, titanic, organic living matter. Trees, animals, men maybe. Okay. Corrine Sandstone in the prison yard at Carson, Nevada, where the pioneers in a scientific discovery which intensified the excitement in California scientific circles caused by Professor Whitney's celebrated Pleistocene skull. The skull itself provoked a small breeze, but the later event proved a whirlwind, which scattered the scientists far and wide. In the summer of 1882, the state felons of Nevada unearthed a prehistoric promenade, so to speak, which placed the wise men of their metal and gave California a mighty boast in the scientific world. While quarrying stone on the shores of Lake Washoe, the workmen uncapped a sandstone spur belonging to the Miocene ter terrary period. Tertiary, sorry. That is, it originally belonged to the period, but the state of Nevada now claims it. So, again, things can get a little wishy-washy, so I apologize. Borders in the 1800s changed drastically. You know, Nevada was actually the Oregon Territory before it was even called Nevada, and large portions of it were part of the California territory. Um, you know, New Mexico was this entire area. It was New Granada. Um, the borders were just shifting constantly. So you'll find some confusing overlap, but this is in Nevada. Yeah, Nevada now claims it, correct. At the depth of 40 feet, the men exposed a horizon of arena seas, shale, three acres in extent, with all manner of prehistoric footprints that wandered aimlessly about in prehistoric mud. For some time, the convicts continued to uncover tracks which the evolutions of the Earth's surface had concealed much more effectively than their own had been. Otherwise, the prisoners would have been then engaged at a more remunera remunerative occupation. However, this has nothing to do with science except indirectly. They kept on blasting out feet and making Jocko's remarks regarding the same. At length, information reached the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco regarding the feet. The learned men at once decided to investigate, as there was possibility of securing corroborative corroboration of the antiquity of the Calaveras skull. So, we covered Calaveras County when we did our California episode. Um, 200 feet, I believe. It may have been more. 200 feet below the ground, they found a, a, a skull, a, man, a human skull. Um, but it was an oddly shaped human skull, and it was incredibly thick. The, thick, the, the skull's thickness was almost an inch. And if you remember, the, Calif the Calaveras County was full of insane mines um, where they were finding petrified titanic animals, giant horses. Um, the forest that, that lied on top of Calaveras County was one of the largest forests in America. It housed 200 plus foot tall trees, some of them being 40 feet, 50 feet in circumference huge monster trees right very ancient trees and then 200 feet below this forest they find this ancient skull and some call it the most ancient skull in the world so these guys are coming to this area looking for for corroboration to the antiquity of the calaveras skull so something we've covered before so hw 
Harkness and C.D. Gribbs, scientists, posted off to examine the footprints and connect them in some way with the feet of prehistoric man. The result of those investigations brought on a discussion which is sometimes revived even to this day. But the identity of the creature who contributed the tracks in the interest of science is still unsolved. Whether it was a biped, a quadruped, or a bear, megatheroid, ichthyosaur, hobo, plesiosaur, man, or ichneumus, apologies on mutilating those words, the learned gentlemen of the academy were unable to determine, but they advanced conflicting theories and stuck to them. Messrs. Harkness and Gibbs found a confused jumble of tracks that were apparently made by beasts, birds, and men of gigantic size. There were unmistakable signs of elephants, horses, tigers, deers, wolves, birds, dogs, and men, which closely indicated that a prehistoric circus and menagerie under one canvas had camped on the shores of Lake Washoe, Washoe to water the animals. So all these creatures were coming to the edge of the water to, to get water. This theory is further, it's further sustained by four small round holes forming a square at one side of the plat where the lemonade stand was undoubtedly erected for the afternoon and evening performances. So like a tent or something like that. From under the superintendent rock back of the, of the stand, eight footsteps, 20 by 22 inches, and with a stride of four feet, came out and headed for the water. As the tracks looked as if they might have been made with tubs, the supposition is, is an elephant. So they're saying a four-foot stride of an elephant, a large elephant. These tracks were accompanied by those of a great wading bird which had doubtless been helping the mastodon with its feed. They went together to the edge of the lake, but got stuck in the mud, as scars on the rocks of today mutely testify. About this time, taking the evidence at hand, the elephant's trainer, the elephant's trainer, crawled out from under the tent and went to rescue, using a short club with a spike in the end. Twelve great footprints of the homo or prehistoric man are still visible, showing that he moved with rapid strides in a northeasterly direction, as his feet were 18 inches long. It will readily be seen that the rapidity arrived at his destination. He wore sandals, according to his tracks, which soon became lost in the mud. Further on in this episode, if we have time, we're going to talk about petrified a petrified foot with a sandal on it that was 20 inches long. Probably a similar person to this. A short distance away, they reappear together with those of the elephant. From this, it is evident that the trainer pulled the beast out of the mud and then getting him upon a firm foundation proceeded to belater the creature for trouble it had caused. There are traces of, traces of a fearful struggle in which the homo or man got the best for a huge cellar-like depression in the earth shows that the Macedon fell over on its side and expired. After the struggle, the big crane waded in about the scene, probably looking for things lost in the fight. Now, I think when we get a little farther into this, I think what this guy was doing was he was hunting animals at the side of the lake. That's what I think was happening. And we have an app, an article to co corroborate this. Now, you know, I'm 6'4", and I have a size 13 foot, just, uh, just under 13 inches, right? Once you get above that, it's actually pretty close. 13s and 14s are about 14 inches long. And so an 18 would be six, eight. It, it varies. Obviously, that's not always height doesn't always dictate shoe size. But you can imagine, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, what does he have? I can't remember size 20, something like that. Um, but he has a larger frame. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. This corroborates what we were talking about earlier with the giants in this realm being between six, five to seven feet tall. 
And yeah, so I think that's kind of where the trouble we're in. And I think this gentleman was hunting on the lake shore. He had a blind and the posts in the ground that they were discussing where it was his blind, right? After the struggle, the big crane waded around. Yeah, I covered that already. At the same time, taking great care to avoid stepping in any of the tracks. At least it fell into one, and startled by the shock, it spread out its white wings and sailed far away. From this point, a set of deep tracks with the toes turned strongly outward and followed by a broad trail indicates that after killing the elephant, its trainer dragged it back to camp. There was one set or series of footprints that puzzled the scientists. Not a little. This was a line of tracks provisionally presumed to be those of a dog, which exhibited a remarkable peculiarity of gait. One theory advanced was that the canine had a trap, I'm sorry, that the man had a traveling companion in the shape of a prehistoric tin can, which may account for any ichthyosaur displayed. I can't ever pronounce that one, but still further away were many other human tracks some with straight pointed toes, some inclined outward and others turned in. This later phenomenon would indicate that there were women in the party. One series of tracks was encircled by little ridges several inches high, closely following the form of a foot. These are supposed to have been left by a man who wore rubbers which came off in the mud and were allowed to remain. Such in brief was the report brought back to scientists Dr. Harkness even brought home a pair of tracks into which he built a prehistoric man over 10 feet high. Some of the other scientists, however, refused to take stock in the human origin of the tracks. Among them was Professor George Davison, who went to Carson and took a few photographs himself of the prehistoric promenade. He found traces of hairy tufts on the heels of the alleged human tracks and gave his opinion they were made by an animal of the, of the Ponte. Ponta Grade order, which uses its feet and hock joints while in the act of protruding tracks. This report created division in the ranks of the scientists. They broke up into two factions and each followed a different set of tracks, while wildly divergent and which never came together. Professor Davidson clung to the sloth or quadruped theory. This is funny. Longo just hopped in and we were talking about giant sloths. And they were they were found all over America, big, 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 big sloths. And they um, there was an argument between scientists in the late 1800s that a lot of these dinosaur quote dinosaur bones were actually giant sloths, and they weren't reptiles. Um, where was I? And with his friends kept hot on the trail, Doctor Harkness and the other side remained loyal to the Homo and perpetuated his theory. Now, the tufts, I'm sure he's wearing some kind of shoe. They're always made of leather with woven material being the tie parts. Um, and we'll cover some of that as we get along here. Friendships of longer years were sundered, and the strife uh, at one time threatened to cripple the cause of science in California, all because the prehistoric man grew whiskers on his heels. Now, again, that's the shoes he's wearing. Um, and why I believe that will be corroborated as we get farther along here. Um, the size of the people hunting the, the blinds, why I think he was hunting by the lakeside, which is what, you know, many, many cultures still do to this day. Even hunters now, um, they make a blind by the uh, water side. So we're going to follow that path into the next article. Uh, where, where is it? Where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. Okay. 3,000 year old records studied dc 1929 fighting red-headed indian tribe denoted by 10,000 well-preserved specimens from nevada mountain cave an extinct race while europe was still a wilderness created with strange powers able to leap into the air and seize arrows <laughs> Berkeley, California, April 1st, preserved for 3,000 years under debris in a bat-infested Nevada mountain cave. The records of an extinct race are being studied by the University of California anthropologists. 10,000 specimens recovered from the grotto in a remarkable state of preservation are now regarded as chronicles of a fighting red-headed tribe of American Indians who were exterminated while Europe was still a wilderness. 
The cavern is known as the Lovelock Cave, a shelf-like niche in the hillside formed thousands of years ago by the wave action of an ancient lake. This is, this is where we're at. Similar concepts to what we were just discussing with the man hunting by the lake. And we'll have another article after this that will further prove what I think was going on. The vanished body of water is known to geologists at, as Lake La Hontan. And we'll get into to big lakes and, and pyramids as we get farther along here as well. Cave near Lovelock, Nevada. The cave is about 22 miles southwest of Lovelock, Nevada. The people who inhabited it are vaguely mentioned in Paiute Indian legends as cannibalistic savages, devoid of fear, who were annihilated in a three-year war with the Paiutes about 1000 BC. Mentioned in the Paiute legends as the Saiduka or the Tule Eaters. So I chased a lot of this stuff many years ago. And the cannibalistic stuff um, was, it, it seemed to have been a misrepresentation or mistranslation. And that they found that these people were actually predominantly vegetarian, um, but they did hunt wild game. And they um, were practitioners of magic. They could, um, they had special powers, according to the Paiute. According to legend, they were able to leap into the air, seize arrows that were shot at them, and turn them back at their attackers. They were exterminated, it is believed, in a fierce charge against the cave by the enemy. Um, this ties in really nicely with my Emperor Tigrinus, um, the timeline, him being the Tesian warrior. He was a gigantic warrior who leaped through the air with his two giant stone battle axes. Um, I think we're dealing with the same people, similar to that, the footprints we were just talking about there in Carson, Nevada, suddenly wiped out. It is thought that the hidden extermination may account for the preservation of so many possessions of the ancient people. The relics have been kept by the dry Nevada climate and are in a state of perfection comparable with that of the relics found in Egypt and Peru. Among the objects discovered, some of them buried under 14 feet of debris, so that 14 feet of debris was also bat guano. This was called the bat cave. Um, and we're going to get into that one next. Material and debris, tectile material, including basketry. Remember, Emperor Tigrinus was what they called the basket tribe or the basket makers. And his tribe was related again with the redheaded mummies of Utah, who they called the basket makers and put in a similar timeline. And matting, wooden implements, weapons, and sandals, just like we discussed earlier with the Carson footprints. Professor A.L. Krober of the University of California declared the material almost wholly pre-Caucasian, having a resemblance of the native culture of California in historical times. Now, what is that? Again, you go back far enough in California and you start to touch on Atlantean stuff, just like the Emperor Tigrinus stuff. He termed it immensely valuable because of the richness of the whole series of objects discovered. Again, that's 300-year-old record study, fighting red-headed Indian tribe denoted by 10,000 well-preserved specimens from a Nevada mountain cave. Here's the image. I just, again, I type in uh, a section, an, a clipping from it. And uh, here are the quote Indians, the AI generated and the fire they're putting they started at the mouth of the cave. And from here, we're going to hop into what they actually uncovered in the cave. Okay. Secures valuable curio from Indians Craftsman, Nevada, 1912. This is the same cave where they found the giant redheads that were mummified. Okay, these were mummies. They were preserved not only under the, de the debris, but also from the bat guano. Tana V, thanks for being here. <clears throat> so, so Dr. Lee adds treasure to his collection, other material discovered. Dr. Lee, who has without doubt the finest collection of Indian relics on the coast and who never overlooks a chance to add a treasure, has just come into possession of what is considered one of his best specimens. 
It is a fish line with about a dozen hooks. Not the silk line of the white man or the steel hook, but hemp. A fishing line made of hemp. Really important. Of wonderful finances and spin and hooks made from sharp bone of some winged bird. Probably the wild duck or goose. Every hook is practically the same, neatly and substantially made, and with it a number of extra points in case one should break. While the operator was fishing the line, the hooks are distributed evenly and look and look like business. The line and hooks came from the bat cave, the same cave we were just talking about with the giants. Okay, so these are these are relics that were found. The ten thousand relics. Here's a list of them. Lovelock, where filled with bat guano. This fertilizer was dug out and shipped to the coast where it has been sold at a great profit. In the excavation, many valuable <clears throat> and antique Indian relics were found. They mostly now decorate museums over the world. The relics have been declared to be at least 500 years old. Yeah, far older. Their wonderful preservation is accounted for from the fact that they were buried under the dry deposit guano which practically sealed them from the air. This was the case in the fish line. During the excavation, other wonderfully made relics were uncovered. Several decoy ducks were unearthed in perfect state of preservation. They were teal and had been skinned and the skins tanned. The frame had been stuffed with tule fiber. Remember, they were called the tule eaters had been stuffed with tule fiber and was so cleverly done that the birds looked as natural if mounted by a modern taxidermist. The decoys have been secured by the Smithsonian. Several fish nets have been unearthed, a number of pieces of pottery and other trappings used to the day far removed, but all showing an even finer craftsmanship than practiced by the Indians of the past generations. For several as far as that is concerned, several generations, right? That's what we keep saying. You know, you know, the the whole Aboriginal and Native American and all of these things. There's they're there they like all the rest of us stand on the shoulders of giants and buried two, three, four lay layers of past civilization. This bat cave has undoubtedly furnished more real articles of value to the relic hunters and museums than any discovery for many years. Those interested in this research have made many inquiries and specimens are scattered far and wide. That's the unfortunate thing. It just takes me back again to that article from the, the governor and the uh, marshal from Colorado pleading with the U.S. government to stop these Smithsonian agents from stealing everything, tearing these buildings down, stealing mummies and shipping them to Europe. That's what this article is saying too. They've all just been scattered everywhere. Dr. Lee has his fish line displayed and looks upon it as one of the finest specimens now in his possession. This collection of arrow points and baskets is a treat to anyone who appreciate the art that is lost and is probably the most carefully selected and complete of any in the world. This just reminds me of of Indiana Jones, you know, him, Indiana dealing with all these curio hunters, you know, the people that had deep pockets and, you know, <clears throat> just, yeah, fantastic. So what do we cover in these? We're dealing with giant redheaded men that were um, annihilated by the Paiute Indians. They knew they were growing hemp. They were creating fish lines and fish nets out of hemp. Um, they created decoy ducks, and like in that previous article about the footprints near the lake shore, and the the gentleman that had the two sticks and what they believed to be some kind of tent covering canopy covering. I believe that was a blind. He was hunting by the water. The elephant got stuck. He rapidly ran to the elephant, killed the elephant, and dragged it back to camp. There were several other footprints involved. He will, his foot was eighteen inches. They believed him to be ten feet tall. I believe these are all the same um, tribes. Now, remember, there wasn't just 
um, these redheaded, quote, redheaded men, the Tijan race, living, they were side by side with two, if not three other distinct phenotypes. And we're going to get into some Chinese, Aztec, and other things along those lines. So here we are, it's 6.30, 9.30 Eastern. Appreciate everybody being here. I hope you're enjoying this one so far. Again, connecting a lot of dots across, you know, from Alaska even to here. Um, really important stuff. You know, redhead, is, redhead mummies have been found from California through Arizona, Utah, just about all these states now, right? Redheaded mummies, some of the oldest in the world. And, um, you know, the the building the duck decoys and all of these really advanced um, methods, right? Now, how long would it take for a cave floor, a very large cave, to be covered in 10 feet of guano? You know, that's that's a substantial amount of time, not 500 years. I'd say probably much longer than that. Um, but yeah, so where to go next? Okay, so we talked about the, the lake. So this is where we're going to go next. This is an article that I posted many years ago, and it's been quite a popular one over, over time. Um, Great Prehistoric Lake in Northwestern Nevada, Nevada, 1916. Lake covered 8,400 square miles. Its deepest part, the present site of Pyramid Lake, 500 feet above current surface. This is the Great Pyramid of Nevada. That's an AI-generated image. Here's what it looked like. This is from 18, this is from 1848, 1844, I'm sorry. Look at this thing, you guys, okay? This is how the pyramid looked in 1844, okay? The lake is 35 miles long, and the, this part of the pyramid rose 600 feet out of the water. Huge. Okay, and you can see the obvious stonework. Okay, um, we're gonna go Pyramid Lake, Nevada, and I'm gonna show you what it looks like today. We're gonna swap presents right here. Apologize, it should be easier to show different things, but it isn't. Here's how it looks today, okay? But you can see in the drawing from 1844, and I'm gonna read the article describing it. It's quite, it's quite incredible. It's obvious that it's not some natural formation. And what's obvious to me as well, is if you look over here, I know it's kind of hard to see. Can I make it? No. Can I just open the whole image? It's view image, okay. If you look over here, right here, that bubbling, do you see that? That's an insane amount of heat. And it would be my belief that this lake was hit by some insane amount of plasma, some kind of a discharge because the rock is bubbling over here, just like volcanic formations you see. And this lake is incredibly interesting. There's all kinds of, if you look in the background, there's other pyramidal type um, structures that are very interesting. And they describe the entire area in other articles, seeming like a, an abandoned civilization lived here. And they describe walls of, of cement. And yeah, so we'll get back into the article here real quick. And basically what they were touching on here is that what they're saying is the deepest part is this same part. So this lake no longer exists, but when it did, it covered 8,400 square miles, absolutely gigantic. And at the center was this pyramid. This was, this was the center of this lake. And this is all that you saw for hundreds of miles, 8,400 square miles. This pyramid was the only thing sticking up. Now, what does that remind you of? We've talked about how the concepts of Noah's Ark and that many, many authors from the 1800s were postulating that pyramids were arcs. Even the, the aboriginal cultures of America from the Mississippi valleys all the way into Utah 
said that a Tesian race built pyramids to survive floods. Now, whether or not it's biblical floods or flood season, I would say it's probably some type of event. But um, even in the Mississippi Valley, they tell they have cultures, the Creeks and the Seminoles have a similar story that these truncated or pyramid-like structures were used to survive um, events, floods, not just the flooding in the Mississippi, but I would say more cataclysmic-like events. And as I've been stating several times, um, and I know we haven't got there quite yet, and maybe people that are new to my channel have not heard me say before, but many of these pyramids are, are labyrinths, are entrances, are doorways to the underground worlds, and that there are tunnels leading in all directions under these pyramids. The Mississippi Valley, once we get over there, um, I have some amazing articles we're going to talk about. But basically, they found tunnels connecting the mounds. Monk's Mound, one of the largest, had tunnels leading in all directions, leading into the mountains. And the mountains are covered in tunnels. All the mountains, you know, most of the mountains that are, you know, again, composed primarily of organic matter, sandstone, limestone, so forth. Um, you know, the, the waters of time and the hands of man have channeled endless caverns and we're going to cover a lot of that as we get there but but yeah i would say this is like a noah's ark remember the pyramid of giza um, when investigated in the 1800s was covered in salt and many authors had stated that it seems like the pyramid was buried underwater except just the tip of it and you know um dr longo gave me the nickname ben ben and my name is benjamin and when you study the ben ben stone and the kind of mythos involved around the Ben Ben stone and the capstone of the pyramid, this whole thing. Um, it just reminds you of kind of the um, reset narrative, um, a cataclysmic event. And yeah, so I think that this pyramid, again, going back to what I was showing you earlier, that the rendition of it and the description of it in the 1800s, 1844, um, was very different from that image that I just showed you. And that something happened just in that short time frame from 1844 to present day that caused severe damage to it. It looks like a, a, a um, the pyramid had been struck by a laser, essentially. Here's a good little description of it. On the 14th of January, the enterprising traveler states, we encamped on the shore opposite a very remarkable rock in the lake. So this is a caption for that image I just showed you which had attracted our attention for many miles. It rose, according to our estimates, 600 feet above the water. And from the point we viewed, it presented a pretty exact outline of the Great Pyramid of Cheops. The accompanying drawing presented as we saw it. Like other rocks along the shore, it seems to be encrusted with calcareous, calcareous cement. This striking feature suggested a name for the lake, and I called it Pyramid Lake, and it's still called that today. And though it may be deemed by some a fanciful resemblance, I can undertake to say that the future traveler will find a much more striking resemblance between this rock and the pyramids of Egypt than there is between them and the object from which they take their name. The elevation of this lake above the sea is 4,800 feet, being nearly 700 feet higher than the Great Salt Lake, from which it lies nearly west, and a distance about 8 degrees of longitude. The position and elevation of this lake make it an object of geographical interest. It is the nearest lake to the western rim as the Great Salt Lake is to the eastern rim, and of the Great Basin which lies between the base of the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas, and the extent and character of which its whole circumference and contents is so desirable to know. And as we stated um, with some of the Starfort um conversations and pyramid conversations and mounds conversations that are all connected to water in the subterranean worlds i would say that these are in some way i would think maybe um multi-purpose you know um perhaps energetic i definitely think they're vaults to the underground um and they could even be drainage systems because like i said this pyramid sat at the middle of an 8400 square mile lake at one point 
great prehistoric lake in northwestern Nevada, a large prehistoric lake which flooded a number of the valleys of the northwestern Nevada at a recent geological date, but has now passed away, was named Lake Lahotan, in honor of Baron Lahotan, one of the early explorers of the headwaters of the Mississippi. The lake covered approximately 8,400 square miles and its great expansion, and in the deepest part, the present site of Pyramid Lake, just as I said. So this pyramid would have been, this capstone, this Ben Ben stone, would have been sitting in the center of these waters. It was at least 880 feet deep. That is, its surface stood approximately 500 feet from the present water surface of Pyramid Lake. The ancient lake had no outlet except the one that led straight up, its water being dissipated entirely by evaporation. A large area a few miles north of Winnemuckin is covered with sand dunes formed since the disappearance of Lake Lahontan. The dunes are fully 75 feet thick, and their steeper slopes are on the east side, thus indicating that the whole vast field of sand is slowly traveling eastward. This progress has necessitated a number of changes in the roads in the southern part of Little Humboldt Valley during recent years. In some places, this region, the telegraph poles have been buried so deeply that they have to be splied in order to keep the wires above the crests of the dune. Now, why is this important? Well, it really substantiates what we've been saying about these giant cities that were covered in sand and turned into mounds. And when they started digging in the mounds, they found it. Karimo, thanks thanks for being here. Yeah. So appreciate appreciate everybody for being here. Um where was I? From traveling eastward, keep them above the dunes. The sand is the light creamy yellow color and forms beautifully curved ridges and waves that are covered with a fretwork of wind ripples. And many of these ridges are marked in the most curious manner by the footprints of animals, which form strange hieroglyphics that are sometimes difficult to translate. So yeah, really important one here. Um, without a doubt, a pyramid man-made there's no way, um, you know, the, the early description of it as these, these are the first people, these are people traveling to California. This is the cow. This is the pre gold rush of California. Okay. Describing this, showing the stone, the stones. And I showed you that image of what it looks like today. It still, to me, looks very much like a pyramid, a stepped pyramid or one that's been, you know, hit by some cataclysmic event. What's next? Time is precious and we're getting low on time. So I want to talk about some mega cities. Hmm, here we go. We're going to do this one. Adam and Eve were Nevadaans. Nevada, 1924. No one ever dreamed that Nevada would dispute Shasta's claim. Now, some of you may remember I talked lightly on this subject, but there was a, an effort in the uh, late 1800s. And remember, Mount Shasta was called Mount Swastika. Okay, so Mount Shasta is Mount Swastika. The origins of the name of Shasta come from the symbol, the swastika. And there was a claim that Shasta was the entrance to Shambhala and that the human race emerged from underground in California, Northern California. And they were calling it, this is what Shasta was saying in their own papers maybe um perhaps a bit fanciful but there has been a lot of cooperation to this people disappearing in the caves um you know a famous geologist went looking for shambhala after really interesting events were happening there and you know shasta like sedona has quite a, an interesting uh, an interesting culture there and many believe it's a very spiritual place anyways home hold old homestead of the human race lee him Lehman Cave abounds in hieroglyphics and e Egyptian pictographs, which prove conclusively one of the cradles of civilization. Adam and Eve were Nevadaans. Due, due to the find made near Lehman Cave in White Pine County, which has given rise to the theory that Nevada might have been the site of the Garden of Eden, Nevada is due for extensive notoriety, judging from samples of publicity that have already appeared on the coast. Nevada as the Garden of Eden. Silver State uncovers some evidence that Adam and Eve were sagebrushers. The world has been speculating for a good many ages as to just where it was that Adam and Eve settled down to housekeeping. Now, again, um, I like to think more of the Garden of Eden as, you know, we could think of them as a, as a 
has this um you know the mormons had a lot of descriptions of 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 this being the garden of eden even the aztecs said that the, the atzlan the land that came from which was supposedly in, near the great salt lake or the dead sea you know and shout out karimo who's done some fantastic videos on utah and as i already covered some of that in my utah video um the biblical overlays are quite remarkable and um, hold even more true to the biblical texts than Palestine or that part of the world. And that they called, the Aztecs called the, that area the land of milk and honey, and that that was their true Garden of Eden. And before these areas were turned into these horrible, desolate deserts, they were full of tropical plants, and the whole area was flourishing. And, um, you know, the whole concept of, you know, the Babylonian gardens and the, the, the rising gardens of Nineveh. And, you know, the, these, this is what, this is what the Southwest of America looked like, you know, millions and millions of people, the, the terracotta canals that go on for a thousand plus miles in Arizona, they're found all over. They're found in California. They're found in Colorado. They're found in New Mexico. This whole region was inhabited by millions and millions of people who were far in advanced. And as, Several authors have said, and I've shown, that they said this area was flourishing while Europe was still a, 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 a wilderness. Where was I? It was the generally conceded that the Garden of Eden was not a landmark of the Western Hemisphere until an enterprising chamber of commerce. This is just like the California story. I, I, I would imagine this is just kind of a ploy to get people to come there, but what they're finding is what I want to cover. No one ever dreamed that the time would come when Nevada would dispute Shasta's claim and bid for fame as the site of the old homestead of the original members of the human race. Nevertheless, the Nevadans believed that they found evidence in Lehman Cave, which abounds in caverns with hieroglyphics and Egyptian pictographs on the walls, which archaeological archaeologists declare prove conclusively that Nevada was one of the cradles of civilization. Exploration and excavation in the cave are expected to disclose the ruins of ancient cities that were buried ages ago by some mighty convulsion of Mother Earth. There has been no dispute that a race of people whose history has been lost once were masters of all. They surveyed hereabouts and in Nevada, but the Silver, Silver State has never previously made claim of being the hunting ground of the ancient Egyptians or the home of Adam and Eve. If the contention of the explorers of Lehman Cave proved true, we will be forced to admit that the Garden of Eden was a far and different place from what we pictured it was, or that it has changed considerably since the serpent convinced Eve it was a perfectly all right to pick the apple and coax Adam to take a bite. Now, again, there's a lot of, you know, silliness in this article, but it's it's the article, it's the Lehman Cave. Lehman Cave is incredible. The government ended up taking over Lehman Cave. And who was involved? The Smithsonian. Um, they found at least 30 miles of, of tunnels in Lehman Cave. 30 miles, you guys. And then it goes dark. You don't find anything about it. Lehman Cave today, you're only allowed to explore, I think, a few hundred yards of the cave. And these, quote, Egyptian and um, the pictographs, all that's been left is the stone drawings outside. Nothing in the cave can be seen. And so the people are just like, oh, this is, this is, this, these are the drawings of the Indians from the culture. But that's, this is the lie again. The pictographs that are left standing are outside, right? Why caves are so important is because they're subterranean and they're sheltered from the incredible events that were happening on the surface. And as I've been stating with buildings and structures, um, we're, we're standing on top of several stacked cultural, um, layers essentially and that it gets more advanced as we go down people animals fauna flowers everything gets larger so inside the depths of the cave is really where the juice is at we're getting low on time and there's a few that i still really want to cover so we're going to go a little bit late today and i'm going to speed this up just a little bit and again thank you everybody for being here i know i'm not the best at reading chat but i appreciate each and every one of you and i hope you're enjoying the series again if you have questions or comments make sure to leave them in the comment section i look over them every day pueblo grande house giant lost race dc 1922 prehistoric metropolis buried ruins largest prehistoric ruins in the western hemisphere Cer ceremonial fire many mounds perfectly formed dice love of gambling 
city eight miles wide, 35 miles of outcroppings. Pueblo Grande housed giant lost race. Excavations in Nevada are disclosing mystery of prehistoric times. St. Thomas, Nevada, March 5th. Excuse me. Pueblo Grande, Nevada's long lost city, believed to have been the seat of a primitive people of giant stature who ruled Western America centuries ago, was being gradually restored today by excavators working under M.R. Harrington, director of the Museum of the American Indian, who was heading the Hay Foundation. Now, I've made connections previously that the Hay Foundation and the Smithsonian were one and the same into the unknown prehistoric metropolis in the muddy and virgin river valley near here exploration has been going on for months but only recently according to harrington has excavation under uncovered almost incontrovert incontrovertible evidence my apologies that the once lost city will prove to be the largest prehistoric ruin on the western hemisphere now remember in colorado they found a building six miles long that had 1,200 rooms. So these cultures are unbelievably advanced and building buildings the largest in the world. Explorations. I've already read that. Big, sturdy, round adobe buildings, some containing as many as 20 rooms with hard glazed floors have been excavated, revealing under their circular courtyards the graves of a vanished race with the skeletons found to average over seven feet just like we were saying earlier. Buried with twins, a woman wrapped in a feathered blanket, remember, the red-headed mummy, <clears throat> Emperor Tigrinus of New Mexico, <clears throat> was found wrapped in a feathered blanket. Excuse me. <clears throat> I did not get enough sleep last night, and I'm my voice is fading. Found wrapped in a feathered blanket was found in one circular burial place with a set of newborn twins buried with her. From what can be seen at present, the whole planning seems to have been circular. The houses having walks radiating from a center sacrificial altar or ceremonial fire. I say it's a ceremonial fire, not a sacrificial altar. Again, this goes back to the enduring flame. When you study these ancient fire cults, um, they exist all over the American Southwest, and they connect with the Persian fire cults. Um, it's quite remarkable. I would say the origins of the fire cult are here, and they are found all over Mexico. And this enduring flame, the concept of the enduring flame, is a natural gas well where these flames burned forever. And when they find some of these subterranean worlds, they find um, these candles never stop burning. In many mounds... Already on Earth, Harrington has found beautiful shell jewelry, artistically cut beads, and decorated pottery of fanciful designs, in addition to quantities of crude hunting implements and other primitive tools. Now, as I've stated in other episodes, the oldest um, shell jewelry of um, with Masonic emblems is found in the American Southwest. The oldest jewelry with the the swastika symbolism is found in the American Southwest. Several sets of perfectly formed dice, some with the corners rounded, were discovered in clay urns, indicating a fondness of this race gone by for the thrill of gambling. The area embraced by Pueblo Grande is eight miles wide and extends intermittently with 150 outcroppings. Eight miles wide, intermittently with 150 outcroppings for 35 miles down the muddy river and river valleys. This city extended all along this valley for 35 miles. This one city center was eight miles long, eight miles wide. I'm sorry, eight miles wide, huge, huge. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions. Strata upon strata, layered with colored pottery and implements, have been unearthed, with the crudest implements usually buried at the greatest depths, had class distinctions. Evidence that class distinctions prevailed among the vanished Nevada race was furnished when it was observed that some of the giant skeletons were found to have far more objects of art surrounding them 
than the average burial mound contained. And again, we poke holes in this. They had three or four different phenotypes living in these cities, and every culture was allowed to have its own sort of religion. Now, I, what I say what, that it was a religion, I don't know. But some of them believed in, in being burnt and, and cremated. Because you have these side by side. You have the Emperor Tigrinus Tesian people that were being mummified in the same complex as people that were that were putting their ashes in jars. And this these these mummifications and these cremations are all belonging to different groups of people. And you're finding them all in the same area. Different types of pottery, Chinese pottery, okay, Chinese, Mongolian pottery, Greek. You have all these distinctive types living in one area it's the atlantean story you know the story of atlantis is the all the root races lived together in atlantis they all were allowed to worship in their own way and have their own culture but they lived in a cohesive group and remember what this said earlier too is that everything was built in a circular layout just like atlantis and uh, if you remember the the Emperor Tigrinus, New Mexico, they they called him the first king of the Aztecs and one of the Atlanteans to migrate after a cataclysm. Evidence, yeah, yeah, we found many implements were discovered differing in construction from the majority of those found in the lost city, giving rise to the theory that perhaps more than one city had thrived over the same spot. Exactly. One city on top of another on top of another. Evidence is that in more modern times, both Pueblo and Paiute Indian tribes have lived in the muddy and Virgin River valleys were also uncovered. Harrington said that he expects to continue his excavations until the riddle of the Pueblo Grande has been completely solved. So, yeah, you all know I make a, I just, I just copy paste an excerpt from the clip and I put it into an AI generator mid journey and it pumps me out. You know, it, sometimes it takes a few tries, but. Overall, it's just it's incredible. It really brings kind of a new visualization to uh, some of these articles for me here. There's a few more. I'm not going to have time to get all to all these. And again, that's why it's important to, uh, you know, hop on Twitter and give me a follow if you haven't already, because then you can go back and see the ones that I didn't get time to cover. Prehistoric reservoirs found in Nevada Valley, Alaska, 1925. Six immense reservoirs discovered. 800 yards long, triangular, a few inches to 60 feet deep, walls 6 to 25 feet thick, composed of granite, six perfectly symmetrical masonry formations, rod sprung catapults. Okay, walls of granite, carved granite, 25 feet thick in some places, 65 foot deep reservoirs. Prehistoric reservoirs found in Nevada Valley, Gold Hill, Utah. So this is where the article is coming from, and it's covering an area that's in Nevada and in the similar area. So, you know, again, um, as I stated earlier, borders changed a lot. So you can get some overlap here. <clears throat> Six cement reservoirs believed to have been constructed 50,000 years ago have been discovered in Spring Valley, Nevada, by members of the Cosmographic Society. The reservoirs are triangular and range from a few inches to 60 feet in depth. The retaining walls are above 800 yards long and are feathered back into the hillside. The walls are from 6 to 25 feet thick and are believed to be composed of granite that's been covered with debris. Yeah, some kind of mud flood. Who knows? The huge tanks overlook a once fertile valley where coal deposits have since been found again coal giant trees coal mines are just the inside of a giant tree it is thought by members of the society that the reservoirs were used for irrigation purposes claims that the reservoirs resulted from glacial action have been denied of course we're dealing with triangular straight lines that are perfectly straight masonry granite stone claims yeah they've been denied of course which points out that no trick of a glacier could construct six perfectly symmetrical masonry formations 
in a limestone cave in the mountains above the reservoir, members of the Smithsonian Institution found several crude implements and weapons, among which were several arrow springs, a little wooden rod, which one end bent into a hook. The arrow was placed into the crook and the rod sprung after the fashion of a catapult. The arrow spring is considered to have preceded the bow by several hundred years. So, you know, they probably some kind of uh, defense of the, you know, water is incredibly important. All right. We got time for maybe one or two more. Um, we did that one already. Paul Creature of Mud. We did that one. <clears throat> okay, let's do this one. Nevada's prehistoric race. Believed to have inhabited believed to have been inhabited by man interior to the glacial period. From the Virginia City Chronicle, photographs of inscriptions on rock near Fort Churchill examined by the Smithsonian Institute scientists and noted European archaeologists are pronounced as belonging to a date far more remote than any traces of man yet discovered. Placed there by a race of men, ancient, as that whose footprints are discernible in the solid rock and state prison quarry, just like we were talking about. It was at first contended that in the inscriptions were made by a race of men once inhabiting the banks of the Gila and the Salt Rivers of Arizona. While there is a resemblance between the inscriptions left by the prehistoric residents of the regions watered by the Carson River and those found on the delta of the Gila and the Salt Rivers of, the, of Arizona, the former are more crude, indi indicating a greater antiquity. Two stone mortars found at Lovelock, that's the cave we talked about with the giants, now at the University of Berkeley, California, are the largest and most ancient relics of the Stone Age, right? And what else were they doing, right? It's not the Stone Age, right? These men were making or carving stone, stone battle axes. They were using crystals. They were making mirrored shields. They were hunting giant wolves, giant saber-toothed tigers, lions, Here's an article that talks about what they found on the Gila River. Again, this is coming from Arizona, but it's relative because they're mentioning that the hieroglyphics and the petroglyphs are similar to the ones found on the Gila. This is an article that I didn't get to in my Arizona articles because I just had too many. These men have been traveling on the Gila for some time. They come to a point. I'm just going to summarize. These are cemented by carbonate of lime. Okay, They're talking about walls on this river looking like they've been hewed by man. Okay, and they're they're cemented by carbonate of lime. This is a similar type to what we were just talking about with Pyramid Lake. Into a concrete about as hard as what would have made by common mortar. The peaks on both sides of the river are very rugged, particularly on the north. One of them looking like a large city on a hill three or four miles below our camp. On the plain near the Gila is a black pyramid of basalt standing isolated about 300 feet high now basalt is insanely difficult to shape it's one of the hardest substances out there and here's a 300 foot tall pyramid of basalt and they're talking about giant cities and concrete structures all along the gila river <clears throat> we got a few more minutes we'll just we'll just kind of move through these at some pace um, I love you guys. Thanks again for being here. Yeah, so hard to work with. Basalt's incredible. And you'll find, you know, basalt pyramids are, they they outlast everything. And to say that these people are, are crude um, Stone Age people is insane. Um, the Stone Age stuff lies on top of the far more advanced stuff. <clears throat> Singular petrifactions in Nevada, New York, 1880. Thomas Lovelock the guy who found the cave and then the cave was named after him. Okay. Connected with Lovelock caves. Yep. Describes this singular petrifactions in Nevada. Thomas Lovelock, the pioneer of Lovelock station, Nevada says the Reno Gazette was describing some of the natural curiosities of his region while in town last Saturday evening. He says that 15 miles North of his place, there is a petrified tree 600 feet in length and two feet thick. Its roots and most of its branches are still perfect. 
The tree is lying on the surface of the ground and is petrified through and through, from bark to core. Clarence King was taken to see the tree by Mr. Lovelock. The geologist pronounces it one of the greatest natural curiosities he has ever seen. Mr. Lovelock says he recently stumbled upon a petrified rattlesnake near his ranch. The serpent's head was gone, but his body and the rattles were whole. The rattles give a, give out a metallic sound when shaken, like the ringing of a bell. The body of the snake is hard as a rock. So 600 feet tall tree, unbelievable, and it's only two feet thick. This is some kind of tropical type of, of, of tree, if I had to guess. Incredibly interesting. Humongous. You know, Book of Enoch type stuff. Absolutely. Um. That's a good one too. Oh, I'm not going to get to all this. Of course, we're getting low on time. Thanks for everybody for being here. I hope you're enjoying the show. Um, 191 people. Wow, break that 200 mark. I hope. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll just knock out a few of these last ones. These small ones. Trace early race, DC 1925. Two miles of hieroglyphics. Early race of inhabitants than here to foreknown. Two and a half miles, chiseled into an obsidian cliff. Chinese characters. Scientists in Nevada uncovered two miles of hieroglyphics. Reno, Nevada, May 28th. Indications of an earlier race of inhabitants in Nevada than any heretofore known are being traced today by field members of the National Cosmographic Society, 20 miles west of P. Oshi, a little city in southwest corner of Nevada. Two and a half miles of hieroglyphics chiseled in an obsidian cliff resembling dark brown glass have been discovered, and Robert Hamilton, the translator, has followed the etched directions for several miles. Enormous quantities of pottery have been uncovered. The pottery, unlike that found in the Pueblo Grande de Nevada at St. Thomas, has an unusually thick fire glaze and decorations in black are said to resemble Chinese characters. That's not hard to uh, wrap your mind around when you think about all the things we've said in the previous episode. Remember, they found Chinese and Phoenician writing in Oregon. Um, Tone Aviv has done fantastic videos on uh, Fu Sang and, you know, um, the origins of the Chinese here in America and the Yucatan and all over Mexico. And that ship, that petrified Moorish Phoenician ship found below ground in Colorado that had Chinese hieroglyphics on it, okay? Remember, Chinese has changed, and Chinese, the, the old Chinese, before the British changed it and made it this conglomeration of languages, was comprised of a language that was eerily similar to Etruscan and Finnish, just like Babylonian, just like so many others that we've mentioned here before. Keeps going back to that, that original source, doesn't it? Ancient Ruins in Nevada, 1869. This is a good one. I definitely want, I think this is the one I'll finish with. Um, again, it's one of the oldest articles. You know, Nevada was still Nevada territory. Its borders had changed, but, you know, the really old ones are special. And it's like, you know, 1840s, 1850s California some. There's not a lot in this era, so. Ancient Ruins in Nevada, a correspondent of the New York Tribune in an account of the Morgan Exploring Expedition to southeastern Nevada and Utah says, 50 miles from Reese River, we found the country well timbered, and in some places the valleys were susceptible of irrigation. A few enterprising farmers had already settled in one of the largest of these, which they had named Cedar Canyon. Snipe plover and quail were abundant and our mess table was well applied with them at this point we bade adieu to civilization timber trees entirely dis disappeared and we entered the large sandy valleys covered with sage stunted brush and a variety of sand plants one of these the mezquite is a shrub belonging to the family of the mimosa it resembles in appearance our locust tree is very thorny and bears yellow flowers and long pods, which have a pleasant sour taste. 
On October 15th, in the center of a large valley, we discovered some Indian salt works, but there were no signs of their having been lately used. In the southern section of the same valley was a curious collection of rocks, mounds, and pillars covering several acres in extent and resembling the ruins of an ancient city. We saw some remnants of what had once been arched with keystones still perfect and a number of small stone pillars constructed with a peculiar kind of red mortar or cement set upright about 20 feet apart as if they had been used to support an aqueduct for conveying water from a large stream half a mile distance to the outskirts of the city. In some places, the lines of the streets were made distinctly visible by the great regularity of stones. These streets were now covered with sand many feet deep and seemed to run at right angles of each other. Some of the stones had evidently been cut into squares with hard tools, exactly, although their forms had been nearly destroyed by centuries of time. The impression forced upon our minds was that the place had been once inhabited by human beings somewhat advanced in civilization. Many traders noticed the existence of similar ruins in other sections of the country between the Rocky and Sierra Nevada mountains. They may probably be the sites of once flourishing fields and habitations of the Aztecs. So yeah, I think we'll end it there. We're about two hours in. Appreciate all of you so very much for joining me and keeping this series going. It's been a lot of work and, you know, all of your wonderful comments and the positive reactions have really kept a fire under my butt to keep me sticking with this. Um, it's really hard to do. My life is insanely busy and finding time just to even get all these articles organized and put together is, is difficult. So you guys being here means a lot. You know, I, I definitely wouldn't have stuck with it if it hadn't uh, um, been received so positively by all of you guys. And um, yeah, what did I miss? She called me trash. Thank you for the, don the donation. What a name. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much, guys. And like I said, um, you can follow my layout on Twitter. It'll be in the description of the video. You can read along basically at your own leisure and go back and look at some of these articles. Um, you can also search my name and whatever whatever you want to look for. You just type my, my handle, one underscore analog underscore nine, and whatever you want to look for. If you want to go back and let's say you missed my Utah episode, and you want to read along with my Utah episode, here it is. Here's my Utah one. Click on it. And here's the full thread of what I covered in the Utah video. And you can do this with every single video I've done so far. So it's been a pretty fun little, um, it's a lot of work. But I think when I get done with this whole thing, it's going to be like the most incredible, easy to navigate our, our, um, um, archive. And that you'll be able to rewatch these and go back through these. And remember, I, I to, this is my 11th year on Twitter. This year is my 11th year, and it's my first month. So it's 11th year, one month into this. And I posted, I think, almost over 8,000 posts. Many of them are newspaper clippings. Yeah, look at that, 11.1K, 69. I always keep it that way because I'm a cancer. And... um um, if you haven't heard my interview on Higher Side Chats, THC, you should go back and listen to that. Um, new material that's coming. Um, I'm, I, I've already put out two episodes for my Radium series, and I included the third episode being um, my interview with the Greg from the Higher Side Chats. You can find those on my channel. Um, episode four is about halfway done. Um, it's going to be a really good one. It's mostly going to be... Um, historical it's mostly going to be the background of madam curry and um the the technical um, um book study of the historical findings and um kind of working starting from the beginning and um covering a bit of what i've already mentioned but again i'm rambling 
Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful Tuesday. And uh, I look forward to reading your comments, guys. Love you all very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you again.